All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, that was loud. Let's go. Good morning, everyone. My name's Sarah Sullivan, and I want to welcome you to the University Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We're really glad that you've joined us today. I want to welcome members and friends, visitors, guests, and I want to welcome people who are here in person, and I also want to welcome all the people who are joining us online. We've got multiple ways to participate today, so we're glad you're here. Just a reminder so that we can all enjoy the service, if you have something that dings or buzzes or distracts your attention, you may want to go ahead and silence that. All right, um, committee announcements. Do we have any committee chairs that have an announcement for us today? While John is coming up, I want to remind people that because of COVID, we are asking people to wear masks while they're here. However, if you're at the podium or at the microphone, it's so much easier to hear without a mask, so you're welcome to take it off then. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, John Mowbray. On behalf of Facilities and Grounds, I uh, just want to remind everybody that next Saturday is a work day. So if you can spare some time between like 9 and 12 o'clock, we'd love to have you come out and uh, contribute any talents you have whether working outside or inside. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm looking to see if there are any uh, youth group leaders in the room, but I do not see any, so I will okay. also add that to my list. I have three announcements this morning, all about meetings and things. Um, this afternoon at 1 p.m., our OWL team, is having an orientation for all parents of uh, middle and high school kids uh, who might possibly, even if it's possible you're attend you want them to attend OWL at... <laughs> what is OWL? OWL is our whole... Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> is our whole life sex sexuality education as, done, as created by the UUA in connection with the UCC many years ago, and it's been... It's evolved over time. It's a wonderful program of facts and learning about communication and learning important things that young kids need. So if, you're, if you know someone, if you think you're attending, your kid might be attending in January when we're holding the class, you need to attend the orientation. You have to attend an orientation in order to have your child attend. And if you don't know if you do or not, this is the way to find out. Um, that's at 1 p.m. Parallel to that, at 1 p.m., is the youth group meeting for all of our youth 12 ages, 12 through 21. So, then the other meeting that's going on, uh, we have a parent, an, 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 a parent support group that's meeting, started meeting online during COVID, and they're still meeting online, Sundays at 9 p.m. via Zoom. If you are a parent of any child and you feel you need support, you are invited to attend and participate, and it's a, it's a loose, loose conversation where you say, hey, this is how my week's going, and I'm a parent, and it's going crappy, or yay, my kid did this, or I'm just a parent, and life is as it is. Mm -hmm. So you can find the link for that on the um, website. And if you have any questions, you should reach out to Crystal Bechtold. I think that covers everything for now. OK. Thank you, Judith. Joey Cole, um, I just wanted to uh, say that we're the, our SAC meeting is next week after service. And uh, it's uh, on Zoom. And you can get the link from um, Oh, well, maybe we're not having a SAC meeting. I'll have to check on that. My apologies, folks. You're right. I, I didn't even think about the overlap. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm also up here with my uh, kitchen hat. And um, uh, today, we want to thank uh, Jill and Larry Vita for setting up for uh, us. 
nice, lots of coffee and stuff. Um, but uh, I do need, apparently, Ann didn't get someone for next week. So if you can do that next week, we'd sure appreciate it. Um, again, it's really fun. And if you're concerned because you haven't done it before, let me know. I'll come in and do it with you. It's always easier if you have somebody there helping. Um, I'll be doing it anyway, probably, <laughs> if we don't get someone. So feel free to stop in. We'd love it. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. So today is what we call Faith in Action Sunday, where we focus on a specific issue in our community or world and how we can be a part of the solution. For myself, I always want to do the right thing. I want to help address injustice. I want to, you know, right the wrongs. But I also read the newspaper. I look around my city and I sometimes feel overwhelmed by the oh so many inequities, injustices, and inhumanity that we see. So I want to revisit the idea that small actions and tiny steps do help. The Rabbi Tarfan says, it is not your responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, but you are not free to desist from it either. And then Melanie Davis says, if ever there were a time for a candle in the darkness, this would be it. Using a spark of hope, kindle the flame of love, ignite the light of peace, and feed the flame of justice. Our opening music today is When Our Heart is in a Holy Place by Joyce Poli, and it's performed by the First UU Society of San Francisco. one of my favorites. So. All right. 
If you will please go ahead and join me in reciting the chalice lighting, whether you're here in Portson or if you're still wa if you're watching us online, please go ahead and join us as well. In our affirmation, love is the spirit of this church and service is its gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another. So we welcome everyone that's joined us either in person or online, but I especially want to welcome people who are visiting us for the first or second time. Here we really value a diversity of opinion, and so you'll find many different topics and perspectives. You need to come more than once to experience the full breadth of our services, and also to feel the warmth and welcome of our community. You might also want to consider joining us for Vespers, which is an online time for reflection and sharing. This is every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Zoom, and the link is online and in our Notable News newsletter. And for those joining us online, Vespers is a great online way to both interact and enjoy fellowship. Speaking of sharing, let's go ahead and move to joys and concerns. This is a time where we share the important events of our lives with each other. Sharing joys and sharing sorrows, these are ways that we build community with each other. If you wish to share our joy or concern, please go ahead and come up to the microphone and uh, if you need, I can bring a microphone to you in your seat. And I do want to remind you that we are broadcasting this service, so anything that you share here will be available online. Good morning, Karen Cowden. I'm sharing for my son, Ethan. He had his first ever soccer game. It's so cute. Reminds me of a story when my youngest was uh, playing soccer and uh, they moved him from the goal position. And he was like, I, I, not maybe a half inch bigger than Ethan at the time. And we kept saying, it's fine, you're going to be fine. And he went, you don't understand, goal is my life. <laughs> we still tease him about that. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Joey Cole here. Um, Last week, I was very upset because of a uh, situation in my neighborhood. I told you there was a shooting. It was very, very frightening. Um, but this week, I have a joy in that um, we're beginning to address it. I mean, we've, got, we've gotten a hold of uh, the crime prevention unit. We're making steps going forward. The neighborhood has kind of come together. Um, it's a, been a lot of work just to get things set up. but. I feel good because we're making positive steps and we're addressing it. And, and like my, my son, his first <laughs> response to me was, have you called the uh, real estate agent yet? And I said, no, because nobody's going to, I'm not going down without a fight, <laughs> for sure. Um, that's number one. But the other thing is, I got to see Judy Shear yesterday, um, uh, and that was, that was a real joy. I haven't seen Judy for a long time, and it was nice to spend some time with her. And it was nice to see Jessica, too. So that was really good. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Lindsay Stroh. Um, on my heart this morning is my brother, Tom Sutton. He's been moved into a um, memory care facility for people with Alzheimer's. And he's feeling very overwhelmed and not quite sure what's going on. And uh, so by feeling sad for him. Um, a joy this morning is I'm going to a folk music concert this afternoon. They have been, uh, this is Voters Grove, which is not far from here. And they haven't had their concerts outside for a while but they're back outside today. At 3 o'clock, anybody wants to go with me, I have the information. It is uh, off of Colonial Photos Grove. It's, this guy has a stage in his backyard. And he brings uh, my friend who are in Jane's Gang Unleashed uh, are the opening act. And then the, 
something called the Wild Chickens or something is the main act. But it's going to be fun, and it's at 3 o'clock today. So I love folk music, so that's cool. Uh, John Mowbray. My joy is that um, 34 years ago, 1987, uh, Amy and I first met. Uh, love at first sight. So. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who shared today. If we could just take a moment to meditate silently on those joys and concerns that were spoken and the ones that remain unspoken in people's hearts. Thank you. Time for all ages. Judith Stein Farrell, our religious education director, will be leading us for this one. <laughs> I'm so glad somebody does that for me. <laughs> so this morning's Time for All Ages is partially conversation. It's a four, So in religious education, November is a fourth principle th thematic month. We talk a lot about the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And how we get, about, get to that is through Re refer referencing our six sources, which are significant. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about something from our six sources, which brings us all around to our first source, which happens to be direct uh, experience. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do, it, it, are you all familiar with, and these are all our sources, by the way, the Shakespeare play, Henry V. Is everyone familiar with that storyline? OK. It's all right. You've never seen Henry V? No? OK. Are you familiar, anybody here familiar with the movie, The, um, the Shoes of the Fisherman with Anthony Quinn? No? Yeah? OK. Anyone familiar with the story of Siddhartha Gautama? OK. Well, I can't ask the question, what do these three stories have in common, can I? Yeah, we've all forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens in the, in the opening, as you learn about Siddhartha Gautama, who's the oldest of these stories, uh, you learn that Siddhartha was a very privileged person right? and, and didn't know what was going on around the world. And what happened was he stepped out of his palace at one point and wandered among the people and said, oh my gosh, I got, there, there's more going on in this world than what I am. How can I help people if I don't understand people? In um, Henry V, now who does, rem does know the play Henry V? Okay, in Henry V, <laughs> Wow, I was, I was hoping, I was really hoping David would be here today. <laughs> All of you out there, I know y'all are going, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. And in Henry V, there's a scene where Henry, right before they go to war, Henry dons the clothes of his soldiers and walks out and sits at a campfire among his soldiers to get a sense of where they are. In the story... Um, of Anthony Quinn, the story of the, uh, the Shoes of the Fisherman, Anthony Quinn's character is suddenly elected pope in the 1980s, by the way. The, play, the story was written in 68. It's during the Cold War. It's in the 1980s. And he decides, right after being elected pope, he too wants to walk among the people. There's a lot more to all these stories. I'm not, they're not exactly related, but the, the common theme here is people of privilege recognized they needed to know more. And that is, and, and to do that, they needed to experience what's really going on in the world. So what I'm saying is we among, we in this room are people of privilege. We are people 
pretty much, right? Who pretty much know where our next meal is coming from. We pretty much know that we've got a house mostly that we're safe in, except at hurricane time, right? We pretty much know that we've got food on our tables. Not everybody has that, and we need to open our eyes, and sometimes we need to walk among other people. So this is my fourth principle lesson, search for the truth, truth, right, through our sources, and yes, popular movies and of, of all centuries and books are part of our sources. They're words of women, of prophetic women and men. And then it's a call to action. So that's your time for all ages today. And I think it relates directly to what our speaker will be talking about. Have a good day. Thank you for that, Judith. It certainly does relate very well with all of what we're speaking about today. Our interlude and offering is an opportunity for you to support both our congregation and the work of organizations in Thank you, everyone. So I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, John Barry, who is an attorney at the Orlando Center for Justice. He asked me, first of all, to apologize to you that he is an attorney. <laughs> However, his work aims to provide expert and affordable legal representation to immigrants, and he has many years of experience doing just that. His niece is actually one of the co-founders for the Orlando Center for Justice and he's going to speak to us today about the work they do there. He also said that he's willing to take a few questions afterwards, if time allows. So if you'll join me in welcoming John Barry. Thank you, everyone. And um, Judith, that was wonderful. What a great introduction. Uh, privilege. So I can tell you without, um, without a lot of delay that I've spent probably most of my legal practice actually fighting other legal professionals with the same degree of privilege that I have to do the right thing, um, which is extremely difficult when that person happens to be a judge, you know, and the judge is trying to deport my, my client child out of the country. Um, it creates a lot of sparks, and a lot of people think, oh my God, you know, you went up in front of a judge and said all those things. And um, what I would like to say is that 
Immigration is such, you know, an interesting story here in the United States because we are the most welcoming country in the history of humanity. While at the same time we've had these terrible periods of dramatic xenophobia where we've pulled back in and 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 resented the world and virtually tried to seal our borders. It's not the first time that it's happened. And it's really kind of interesting the ebb and flow of immigration policy and how it tracks with how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about our democracy, and how we feel about our values. What does America represent? We have, of course, an enormous cornucopia of resources, historically speaking, to reach into uh, to be able to guide us. Do we guide ourselves, for example, um, from the post-9-11 world when we started racially profiling people of Middle Eastern descent and where we tasked the FBI to spy on many of our neighbors just because of their professed beliefs? Or do we go to Emma Lazarus's wonderful poem on the, on the Statue of Liberty about taking the huddled masses from around the world and in the incredible conveyor belt that is the United States primary and secondary education system, creating a world-class community that are able, a community of talented people who, if we look at that conveyor belt, you know, and we look at the waves of immigrants past, have given us the keys actually to really enjoy the world that we're in now. If we think about the pandemic and the inventions that have gone so far to liberate us from the crushing economic blows of the worst pandemic in a century. The names Pfizer and Merck come to the forefront. Immigrants of yesteryear, German immigrants who came to this country over a century ago and founded these incredible companies who are now at the forefront of our biotech. It reminds us that Ben Franklin was not very happy about German immigration, right? And he had not very nice things to say about our sauerkraut eating strange Northern Europeans who were not really considered Europeans. They were considered barbaric at the time. So when we also think about Ben Franklin's comments, we also are reminded that wave after wave of our immigrant uh, forefathers and foremothers who were Italian or Yiddish or Russian or Irish came to these shores and experienced something akin to America's great hazing ceremony. Whereas freshman arrivals, right, to the American high school, they were pushed down, they were insulted, and they were made to suffer the most incredible and horrendous <laughs> treatment. And it was only after years and years of struggle and kindness, people like you in this room, many famous, famous, famous people too, um, that all of those folks became part of the fabric that is the United States and never gives us a second thought, right? Not to mention the fact that it has enriched our culinary traditions incredibly. When I was growing up in the Midwest, I'm from Iowa, my mother used to think that ketchup was an acceptable pasta sauce, right? <laughs> Thankfully, it was only after discovering, you know, the wonderful invention, that, and the Italians, of course, had brought this way before I was born, but mom, poor mom, never caught up fast enough. But it's interesting how in the United States, we have this passion for Thai food, Vietnamese, for for sushi, you know, for Mexican and Peruvian cuisine. I don't know if you guys have tried it. But when we start talking about the people and the languages and customs that they bring beyond the food, then all of a sudden, sometimes people have their hackles raised. And they think, you know, I know that in the past we said bad things about the Russians, the Italians, the Germans, the Irish, and about all of these other folks. You know, but they were different because they were able to adapt and to assimilate into this great melting pot that is America. Whereas today, all of these folks that are coming to us on our southern border, they speak Spanish, they eat a lot of rice and beans, they eat this tuber called yucca, and 
you know, that could maybe completely wipe out our potato-loving culture. And so we think that the most recent arrivals, for some reason, are not going to be able to join this phenomenal tradition, this robust conveyor belt of taking people of very scant means, but rich cultural traditions, rich religious belief and rich family loyalty, taking these people and adding them to this mix to continue to create this wonderful thing called America. I have the most incredible job at Orlando Center for Justice. We're, uh, I think we're 16 people now. We have six attorneys, 10 support staff. My job there is dedicated to children on a pro bono basis. My clients are unaccompanied children who are, for the most part, fleeing the effects of climate change, political instability, family violence, crossing Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico, and coming to the United States border in search of asylum, in search of relief from being trafficked or from being victims of crime, or from being abandoned, neglected, or abused by either their custodians or by their parents. You would think, how is it that somebody could say that in such tragedy, that's the best job you know, that he could possibly have at Orlando Center for Justice? What is wonderful about my job is that in the United States Congress many years ago, some very visionary people decided that we were going to treat children from around the world in the same manner regardless of their country of origin. An incredible, prophetic, profound, and I would say nearly religious um, inclination to do that. And so our laws are such that if I have a child, a client who pays nothing, who comes here to the United States and happens to be the victim of, let's say, labor exploitation working on African palm, palm pl uh, plantations in Honduras. This is my most recent case that it, I was able to get a dependency order from last week, who from the age of 12 was scaling up these very dangerous, uh, you, you know, large palms to harvest the fruit, which are, weigh about 70 pounds or so on his little back, going to take it to a processing mill, uh, scurrying among the tractors, trying not to get run over, and being paid a pittance that is below the already pitiful you know, uh, uh, national uh, going wage in Honduras. Uh, just so that he would have the opportunity to, to try to, to feed his mom, who was profoundly incapacitated. Um, and we were able to get him some documents. So what I'm trying to say is, is that we know that we have two minds in the United States when we think about immigration. We have the mindset that we're already full, we have enough, and we don't need any more. And then we have the other mindset that as a country of immigrants uh, that has had enormous bounty from allowing wave after wave of, of, of immigrants into the country, we've created certain pathways for people to not just work here, but also become residents and then eventually citizens. So one of those pathways is the pathway that I've described to you that allows a child who's been the victim of abuse, abandonment, neglect in their country of origin to come here to have legal counsel, which is, which is me and thousands of other attorneys in the country, to shepherd their cases through this system where we get to see this miraculous transformation of these young children who have risked all odds to go from their country of origin to come to the United States and to start their process before a judge in a dependency court, and then to get to school, to get uh, food because they qualify for services, and then to be able to process documents that allow them to become residents, then eventually citizens in the country. And then, as I was telling you earlier, 
even though we criticize our public education system, it is second to none in the world to take someone from anywhere in the world and to turn them into really incredible English speaking, pretty talented young women and men who are able to go on immediately to interesting vocational careers. I've got one of my children studying nursing right now, and then another child who's, uh, who's just interested in working in construction and is very, very good at framing and drywall. And these are two things that we really need. And it's of great irony that we talk of people fleeing violence and in instability and persecution in their countries of origin, mostly in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. And coming to our borders, we, you know, a lot of the press thinks of this as a surge, as a migrant caravan, as invaders, as if the barbarians, you know, were coming up from the south and they were coming here to take our jobs or to be a drain on the national fiscal policy, when the exact opposite is true. It's at the same time that we're talking about these potential future neighbors in this way that we're also talking about record deficits of finding qualified employees to work in our fields or to work in service industries. How is it that we could be entertaining anti-immigrant ideas at the same time that we don't have enough people to do the jobs that we have? We are an aging population here in the United States as well. And we have a number of important deficits in the care fields and the service industries that have a ready and willing workforce ready to plug. I could come to you and I could talk to you about this being the right thing to do, having an opening and caring and compassionate Immigration policy is something that we should do as human beings, that we should do regardless of our political philosophies, that we should do simply based on the fact that, as Judith was saying, that we're powerful through our privilege and we're able to extend so many benefits to other people without it, without it really costing anything. I could go that route, but it makes all the sense in the world to be compassionate. It is common sense for us, faced with our labor deficits, faced with our aging population, to find ways, more legal mechanisms, for people to come to our country, to go into that wonderful system of primary and secondary education, to be able to participate in this experiment, which has been going on you know, for, for you know, a quarter of a millennium, very successfully the last time I checked. So what I would like to, to, to emphasize is that compassion is a really wonderful thing. And I think we should always lead with compassion when we can. But when it comes to immigration, there are so many hackles that get raised that it's almost best before the compassion to start talking about the common sense approaches to it and to immediately nip in the bud any of the reservations that people have about immigration. So what I would like to do is just very quickly address and, and dispense with all of those so that if you have an opportunity to have a persuasive conversation with somebody using your privilege to be able to make the world a slightly better place by celebrating and affirming that immigrant welcoming Statue of Liberty Emma Lazarus poem approach to how our American policy should be to the world, let's, let's take each one of those in turn. So they take our jobs. And God, I hope they do, because I'm not getting on my roof. You know what I mean? And I'm also not going to be picking strawberries and tomatoes. And I had this wonderful conversation with Peter earlier today because we were supposed to be addressing food insecurity. There's nothing like food insecurity when a hurricane comes and devastates your, your city, like just happened in Honduras and Guatemala last year uh, with two major hurricanes. Climate change has, is, is going to continue to create waves and waves of people from the global south coming up. Uh, to, to Europe and to the United States. 
um, and it's just going to happen. So when they come, if we have an opportunity to bring them in, if we're able to find ways of plugging them into the economy in ways that are beneficial for both them and for us, the common sense approach, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able, by creating mechanisms of residency, we'll, inc inc we'll, we'll improve our food supply because by empowering people that pick our food, the growers will be less inclined to use poisons in their crops. If you go to Apopka, we know the story about Lake Apopka, which is the story of what happens when you treat farm workers terribly and you also treat the land just as horribly as you treat the farm workers, you end up creating a huge Superfund site, you know, where decades and decades of work has to go into repairing it. If you have a sensible and common sense immigration policy and agricultural policy, you're going to, you're going to decrease food insecurity, you're going to increase uh, uh, better land use, and you're going to create uh, much better uh, wages and salaries for the people who are going to be working uh, and, and, and picking the, the food for us. So do immigrants take our jobs? Um, they do. The, frequently the jobs that we don't want to do. In addition, when we look at those industries, like the auto industry, the auto parts industry, that have left the United States, or that are still here but that are paying much lower wages than they were before, meat packing comes to, comes to mind. Um, in all of those industries, it was employers that de-unionized, that broke their unions, that virtually got rid of the, the, the native workforce, that is to say the people, by just um, paying starvation wages. And then it was only after the labor busting and the uh, moving the plant outside of the United States to Mexico or threatening to do that, that then immigrant laborers ended up coming in because they would accept the much lower wages that the employer was ready to pay. So that's a story where immigrants get the bad rap, but it was really the owners of the factories and the industries that caused it to happen. So the answer is if we want to have you know, better jobs in the United States, don't look, to, don't look to limiting immigration. That won't help. That'll only exacerbate the problem. We need to look to actually strengthening our National Labor Relations Board. We need to strengthen uh, the ability and the right uh, of workers to organize in various industries, and that will lift all boats. The second thing, are immigrants a drag on our fiscal policy? In other words, do they consume more more services than they produce. And the great irony here is that immigrants, especially our undocumented immigrants, tend to pay tons and tons of money into Social Security with fake numbers that they can't draw. So they have to pay the money into the system, but they can't draw it out because that Social Security number doesn't belong to them. It is a case, effectively, of taxation without representation. <laughs> the very same rallying cry of our forefathers and foremothers, right, during the, the Revolutionary War. These folks, right, who are working very hard and diligently and paying their taxes, taxes they will never be able to draw out on, um, are actually helping to buttress the system that we all benefit from, our Social Security system. And immigrants, I already mentioned, you know, so many, the founder of Tesla, you know, is an immigrant. Uh, you know, name your pharmaceutical company. It's Moderna included, right, is also founded by, by immigrants. It is a source of enormous cultural and intellectual, and as I mentioned, culinary wealth that we are able to let people into our country. So what I would say, oh yeah, and then the third argument is, well, they're criminals. And our the last president, uh, you know, that was in office made made a great deal of this. Um, it, it I could throw facts and figures at you. There's really no reason to do that. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that if you're scared of being deported, if you're terrified that you're going to be raided at your work site, that somebody from Immigration and Customs Enforcement is going to come after your family, uh, your son, your daughter, your 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 spouse, or get you at a work site, or 
how any kind of contact with a law enforcement system, uh, a traffic stop for a taillight or something like that, could lead you to being put into the custody of Immigration and Customs Enforcement for deportation, it creates an enormous deterrent effect where most people who come to this country and live in the shadows are behaving absolutely enormously better than the native population. And it creates another unfortunate irony where we're thought that, where we have to think if our undocumented population is behaving so much better than the native born, maybe we have to th rethink this whole thing of exile and deportation, <laughs> right? So what I've done for all of you today is make a full-throated defense of why immigration is not only good, it's great. I don't want to sound like Tony the Tiger <laughs> by saying that, but I, I, I am an immigrant. So in, back in 1993, I left the United States to go to South America, to Colombia. I wanted to go to the most dangerous place I could possibly find so that I could learn Spanish where no other Americans would be. And in 1993, with Pablo Escobar on the loose, he had just recently broken out of his prison, and he was bombing. He was trying to bomb his way back to the negotiating table with the government. There were no Americans in Bogota except me, and I think you know a bunch of C CIA and DEA people who were you know desperately trying to get him. And I was welcomed with open arms. And I very quickly took a six-month university trip and turned it into a seven-year experience where I was teaching at universities. I was at the Universidad Nacional. I was working at the Javeriana. I was working in the multinational sector. I was even working with a number of human rights um, agencies with, uh, with the government. Of course, they were failing miserably at, at what they were supposed to do, but they were working against tremendous odds. But it showed me that there's a proper way you know, for people to have the freedom to be able to move from country to country and to be accepted and embraced wherever they go. And it was a great privilege, you know what I mean, of course, to be white, to be a male, to be English speaking, to go from the United States to Colombia and to be greeted, you know what I mean, with, with open arms. And it just dawned on me that none of those things were me. They were all as a result of a bunch of historical inequities and injustices that had passed, but that I had ended up, you know, being the unintended beneficiary of. And I thought, you know, this is just totally wrong. And it should be the case that anybody who voluntarily, or even more so, involuntarily gets forced out of their place of birth to move as our brothers and sisters in Central America and Mexico and South America right now that we not only owe them the obligation of compassion, but more importantly, common sense, to do the right thing, and most importantly, to do it courageously. So I don't act like a moderate <laughs> in, in immigration policy. I think it's the best way forward for our country. And I'm happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Start with John and then her. I just want to say thanks for all that you do. It's great work. Thank you. So OCJ, you know, uh, the Orlando Center for Justice, that the most important thing that, that we can do for folks that are here because there don't exist a lot of mechanisms to be able to get residency and citizenship is that when you're in the legal system, you need high caliber re legal representation. Right? And to do that, it, it takes a lot of money. We make it so that money is not the issue. We bridge our way to our clients by, if they can pay, great. If they can't, great. We're going to take, take your case anyway. A lot of the cases that we're going to do are, are abused uh, spouses, particularly women and children, through the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, I already mentioned that I, mo all of my clients are, are children, which are fabulous. And yes, it's terrible that they've been abused, neglected, or abandoned, but they're on their way to an incredible future. And I mean, it's fabulous. 
right, the, the things that I get to see. I'm in at least weekly contact with all my kids, and they're not talking about the trauma that they suffered back in home country. They are so focused in today, proud to talk to me in English, you know, and tell me about what they're going to be studying. So it's a miraculous transformational experience. Your question? Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to drive around Orlando and, and see you on a billboard with a <laughs> brown or black people, one holding up, John got me my green card. You see? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. My wife is in a nursing home, and uh, they're desperately short of uh, workers. And the ones that are there are all from the islands, virtually. And uh, it's strange. I, I don't want to go into this in great detail, but we have, uh, we have desperate need of people in the medical field at that level. Desperate. They can't find enough. And, and the other thing is, uh, I'm wondering now, I'm not going to run around there asking how many are documented. But what is the uh, danger to the business these days? I, I know that law has, I, I don't know if it's changed or not, but it used to be, uh, you know, thousands of dollars a fine if you had an undocumented worker. How, how does that stand today? So, so the system of immigration um, penalties in the United States is really directed to create a climate of fear for the people who are living in the country, either undocumented or documented. Because if you make a mistake, and a mistake could be uh, a DUI, a mistake could be you know a marijuana offense or something like that. So even if you're documented, you could be very easily uh, expelled from the country. We're talking exile, which you know to the Greeks, ostracism was by far a fate worse than death. You know, if Socrates had been exiled rather than, you know, forced to drink hemlock, I think it would have been worse for him, to be honest, to be divorced, you know what I mean, from, from, from a, a Athenian culture. So even though the penalties exist on the book, the penalties are really designed just to go after the most vulnerable part of the system, which is the immigrants themselves, both documented and undocumented. So when people talk about, well, they need to follow the law, right? Uh, just remember all the Kafka that you've read about the law. But um, the law is really a question of what values are, do we have that uh, allow us to allocate our scarce justice resources across all of these different laws? What about corporations, for example, that are polluting you know, major water fares? you will find that 100 times more resources are dedicated to trying to round up people who are working on construction sites or corporations that aren't paying their taxes. You'll find that 50 times more resources are dedicated to uh, harassing you know, immigrants at uh, different kinds of border, border sites. So employers really don't pay a penalty. They're supposed to, but they don't. And that's because, once again, it's to gin up a climate of fear to keep immigrants, uh, both documented and undocumented, very docile in the country. Excellent question, thanks. Thank you again for your talk. I um, taught a good number of international students in my role at the college, and I always found it interesting that many of them had former careers, dentists, lawyers, doctors, that were just lost once they came across our, our borders. Um, so just note to that. But I am still unsure where we are with all of the many children that were separated from their families some time ago in the previous administration. Um, so if you have any insight on where we are with that, that'd be helpful. The Biden administration made it their top prior priority to reunite those children with, with their parents. Uh, there are still many, we're talking hundreds, that haven't been reunited. Um, the only positive thing that we can say from that is that that image plus the image of immigration and customs enforcement guards on horseback chasing down Haitian immigrants, which was redolent of slave patrols, you know what I mean, from the 1840s and 1850s prior you know, to the Civil War. Those images which are seared into our minds and into the public consciousness around the world have really helped to uh, stimulate, you know, uh, uh, a better debate. The Biden administration is actually paying 
uh, compensation to families that haven't been able to be reunited. And I would say the better thing is, is that many of the children are, they're victims of abuse or neglect or abandonment. In other words, they would be my clients. Um, and so even though they can't be reunited with their parents, in many cases, that's a good thing because they were fleeing from a situation of abuse. Uh, and, and all of those children are going to be getting legal representation to be able to help out their cases. So there is a bit of a silver lining there, but it's still important to remember how barbaric, you know, our, a, a government policy can, can create a degree of callousness that reminds us of Hannah Arendt, right? When she wrote about the banality of evil, where you just have bureaucracies like Immigration and Customs Enforcement that receive a command that they're supposed to round up anybody who's, who's out of status. It could be somebody who's got a visa that expired or came in without a visa, but they have no criminal record and they're family members. When you deploy, when you follow those instructions, it can create an enormous amount of, frankly, evil consequences, like what you were pointing out with the family separation policy. Um, I think we're going to have to go ahead and close up, but if you would be so kind, John, as to stay afterwards, I'm sure people would love to talk to you and ask more questions. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for the for fellowship. I appreciate it. If you ahead, go, go ahead and join me in extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this. Thank you all for joining us today, everyone here in person and everyone online. My closing words are by Tanya Marquez. Do not fear agitation, for agitation is the rhythm of life itself, to be put into motion, to be stirred. Do not fear the movements that decenter what you always thought was permanent. You carry within the center of your understanding the compass to show you the way. 
Carry with you the love that will hold you, the vision that will guide you, the relationships to all beings.